Our third panel discussion will focus on what corporate donors and grant makers look for in a charity before, before supporting its cause, whether monetary or otherwise. Okay. From the other angle, charities will also share their perspective on the areas which re re they require support in and difficulties in meeting the requirements of corporate supporters. Right? As you can see, all the moderators and the panelists are ready to share with you. Okay, so I will introduce you to them. Our moderator is Mr. Graham Owens. Our panelists are Ms. Yap Su Yin, CEO from Tan Chin Tuan Foundation. Mr. Kaka Singh, Chairman and Senior Partner of RSM Chiu Lim. Mr. Lu Chi Wen, General Secretary of YMCA. And Mr. Chandra Mohan Ratnam, partner of Raja and Tan. Thank you everyone for staying for the last session. Um, it's always good to see so many people here and you haven't all run away after lunch. Um, we've got a fantastic panel, um, lots of experience. Most people on the panel have experience from both sides. So they've worked in the MPO sector, charity sector, and also in the corporate sector as well. You've got all of their details in, in the booklet, so I won't kind of go through any of that, and we'll just get straight into having a discussion. Okay. Um, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to be able to ask questions as well later on. We want a lot of this to be interactive with you. Um, so I think we're going to be using pigeonhole again for you to be able to, um, to, to, to post questions to me, and then I can put them to the panel. Um, I think, first of all, we'll probably just go um, to each of the panel members um, and they can give you an idea of some of their experiences, um, some of the difficulties and some of the perspectives as well that they have for the, the positions that they're, that they're actually in now. Um, so I think, firstly, we're just going to go to um, Su Yin, who's the CEO of um, Tan Chin Tuan Foundation. Um, we're looking, you know, for, to, to, to get this kind of practical approach, I suppose, after the, 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 the sessions that we've had already today, and to look at what actually is happening on the ground. You know, what do grant makers look for? How does their process work? It's probably what a lot of you are interested in. Um, so um, I'll just hand over to Sue Yin now, and, and, and I suppose the question to her is, you know, kind of how do you give, why do you give, you know, what, what's the reasoning behind the processes, that kind of thing. Um, I think we have to appreciate that, you know, kind of, it's from a personal perspective and from their particular um, company or foundation perspective, it's not going to be exactly the same, but, but hopefully we'll get a good idea of how people, um, you know, kind of the processes that they go through. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Su Yin. I'm very happy to be here. I recognize many faces here. Your, many of the organizations that you represent uh, is or was a beneficiary of the Tan Chin Tuan Foundation. The foundation is a local philanthropic one, meaning that we started locally, but we uh, have uh, causes that we champion in Singapore as well as in the ASEAN region. Now, what are the causes that we champion? Educational and community developmental ones, which include aged causes, healthcare, uh, children and youth at risk, uh, among others. So quite a fair bit. But we also found it critical to have funding parameters, things that we do not fund. And um, among these uh, would, would be things like maybe sports or arts or something like that around that. But even so, if you go onto our website, you'll say, huh, but there are so many uh, arts-related activities that the foundation runs uh, and therefore seemingly support. So what's cooking? Well, what's cooking really is what you see an interplay of various factors. Uh, while on the outset, you might think that grant-wise, we want to make sure that there are priority areas and we articulate these priority areas repeatedly so people can get the idea, in spite of which they will still try, but no problem. Um, there are also areas that we've, we know are worthwhile causes, worthwhile to explore, and uh, we are open to that. So for our program side of what we do, um, we do engage several arts entities in order that they would perhaps um, render their services or expertise to children and youth at risk. So we've, we've found opportunities uh, where we could get the interplay going. 
we get uh, different clusters to come together, we see how they work together, whether they pan out, whether they are uh, turf centric, you know, whether they're very, they say the PR is very good at saying that they can do all these things, but when it comes to roll out on the ground, it's something else. So these things you will only know sometimes when you work with the people. You get in touch with the volunteers, you have to look into their, uh, the, the way they interface with you. Um, to be fair, I mean, not all grant makers would have the bandwidth to do so. And uh, we're very glad that we've built up a team that not just uh, deliver grants and accesses them, for, but also um, devises programs and uh, projects that we can engage our potential partners and existing partners. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, I'll hand over now to um, Mr. Kaka Singh. Um, he has huge amounts of experience in this, in this area, working from both sides, obviously on the corporate side with RSM. Um, but we met on Monday just to have a chat about this panel and he kind of listed off this huge amount of experience that he's had in the, in the kind of charitable philanthropic sectors as well. So, um, Ms. Singh, could you just um, kind of give us an idea, I suppose, of, of, of the kind of both sides that, that, that you see where perhaps some of the problems and gaps are? Well, this conference, I'm, I'm Kaka Singh. Uh, this conference is on governance, and I think everybody talks about governance. But I'm going to go away from that. Maybe as a passing remark. Yes, we need to have governance because it's like a two dimension. One is constructive, one is protective. Constructive in the sense means it helps the, the management of the charity, the title of the charity, to do the right thing. Okay. Protective means, well, making sure they don't do the wrong things. They can get into trouble. As our uh, chairman of the well, <laughs> said, majority said, well, reputational risk is very important. So yes, protect the reputational risk in the case, you know. But what, what we really perhaps want to talk about is, okay, you know, that the, from a donor's perspective and also from a recipient's perspective in the case, okay, you know. The NVPC, the research, and they found that, well, people donate, they prefer to donate cash. Whereas, or rather, people want to receive, they prefer to receive cash, but people who donate, they prefer to donate goods in kind or service in kind or whatever it is in the case. Nothing wrong with that, but but I think it's good if it's right if it's right right sort of a, right sort of a in kind uh, recip, uh, receipts anyway. Okay. And the next thing is we, we say well people donate because they want to see something to be done good. In any case, okay, you know. I was looking at this research paper. It says people donate. Not it's it's not like a tax where you are tax. You got no choice. People donate because they want to give where they want to give. Okay. Not to do, not necessarily do good, but for some other reasons. In any case, okay. One of one reason is the donors have their own tastes and preferences and passion. Nothing about needy. Donors' personal and professional backgrounds. Nothing about needy. Donors' perception of charity's competence, notably efficiency in how the money is spent. So this is one we're talking about: corporate governance and governance and things like that, strictly on how the money is spent. But there's only one aspect of it from a donor's point of view. And lastly, I think very important for small charities, okay? The donors desire to have a personal impact such that the contribution makes a difference and not drowned out by other donors and government funding. So why give to NKF when they got so much money? <laughs> <laughs> Give to Sana. I'm on the board of Sana. <laughs> okay. We we are short of money. Okay. We've been told that while the donors like to give donations, where children are involved, because children grow up, they become good citizens. Okay, and contribute to the economy. Okay. Well, I'm in Sana, and of course the, these people were taken drugs and have come out. Okay, but. We serve the same purpose because this sana, they have family members who are children. And if you don't look after this ex drug uh, person, the family suffers, the children suffer. 
So why are we less worthy than a children's society? <laughs> for example, okay, you know, we are talking about a competition for funds anyway, okay. <laughs> okay. So please donate to Sana. <laughs> Thank you. Just, just, just a small pitch there. Um, but, but it was, the, you know, one of the conversations that we did have on Monday was about the competition for funds and about, you know, how, how some do get drowned out. And I think we'll go on to discuss, hopefully, a little bit later, um, you know, about the professionalism of, of institutions and how you should pitch and how you should build your relationships. Um, I'd just like to pass over to uh, Mr. Lo Chi Wen, um, who is General Secretary of, of, of YMCA. Um, he's worked in a lot of different areas um, as a volunteer um, and also on the policy side as well. Um, obviously, YMCA, we discussed, is, is quite a well-known institution globally, um, which, you know, potentially could help, um, you know, when you're going out there. But I think a lot of the, the, the things we were talking about were, were building relationships. So could you just give us um, uh, some words of wisdom um, on your experiences over the last few years? Uh, I wouldn't dare to say that it's words of wisdom, but uh, I try to be practical. Um, YMCA still needs to raise funds. <laughs> okay, although you look at our financial reports, we seem to be quite okay, but we still need funding. So Tan Chin Tuan is one of our strong supporters for the last more than 10 years or so. Okay, but uh, I think as uh, Mr. Kaka has said, I think there is this alignment issue between what volunteers, uh, what volunteer organization or MPO see as a need and versus what uh, uh, foundations or individuals see as their need. So how do you connect these uh, uh, different perceptions or how, you, how do you need the, to narrow the bridge, uh, the gap? I think a lot has to do with uh, communication. And a lot of times, I think VWOs or MPOs love to communicate what we do, uh, how we do it. But I think what is more important is to talk about what's the purpose of doing it and why are we doing it? No, it's just, for example, a very simple uh, going to one room uh, elderly homes to do cleaning. I think a lot of organizations do that. Uh, um, but do, is our purpose just to give the elderly a clean environment to stay in? Uh, by having this objective, are you able to attract young volunteers to go in? What is your real purpose in wanting to do it? I, I think uh, we could raise it uh, one level up and say that, why don't we do this as part of intergenerational bonding? To have the young and the old to work together. And I think the foundations and the individuals will see it from a different light, rather than the getting, uh, okay, uh, YMCA, one of our programs is also Spring Clean. Okay, we have NTUC Fair Price to, support, to supply us with all the cleaning materials. Okay, our young people go in. But we tell our youth volunteers, you don't go in and just clean up the house. We expect you to communicate with the elderly. Because one of these days, your own parents will get old. How are you going to communicate? So this is a chance for you to learn if you have communication problems with your parents. So you better learn about it. Dementia and all the other issues are coming up. So how do we engage the young? I think we, we need to think through more about uh, purpose and our identity, more than what is our uh, outcome. Uh, okay, I, I don't think I should use the word outcome, well, output. <laughs> and, uh, and, and also the method, what is our product? Um, for VWOs, must you always get funding? I think there are many ways that you can collaborate with the corporate world. Um, for example, uh, one of the things YMCA did was that we are fortunate, we have two strong social enterprises, one in education, one in hospitality. That covers more than enough our corporate costs because a lot of funders do not cover corporate costs. So we are blessed in that. So whatever extra there are, it goes back into community service. 
Now, how do you engage? It's just like uh, when we train volunteers, we know we don't have the skills and the capacity to do it. We partner NUS Business School. We run a nine module program to help to train volunteers to equip them. Um, we tie up with uh, Citibank to run the City YMCA U for courses. Uh, the young group last year, 400 young students engaged more than 10,000 of their own friends and brought in 900 over 1,000 for the 30 over charities that were in the program. So the young can contribute, give them the space to do so. And I think there should be more collaboration between the charities, uh, which I think down the road, I think there is not too much choice in land scarce, in, in, in uh, constraints in cost, uh, constraints in space, constraints in many other areas that we need to really look at how we can partner better. And uh, really, uh, the other thing that is that we can approach corporates and ask them to help us in our IT, in our finance, in our HR. In fact, uh, uh, recently, we had uh, one uh, IT company, major IT company, who came in and helped YMCA to do a strategic planning for our IT program. So I think there are many ways that we can engage corporates. Uh, it's a question of you must know what your organization stands for. You must know what your organization represents. Rather than talking about the, the methods and the product, and then you will be able to communicate better with the uh, corporates, with the fundraisers, with the grant, to, uh, grant makers, and there will be greater clarity. And I believe that uh, with more partnership within the VWO sector, uh, it will become a better for all. Thanks very much. Um, so um, we'd just like to move on to uh, Mr. Chandra Ratham, excuse me, <laughs> get my tongue around it, um, who's a partner at Raja and Tan. Now, Mr. Uh, Ratnam works for the um, foundation, the Raja and Tan Foundation. Uh, sorry, you do work. Um, no, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a full time lawyer. Yes. But the foundation is something I hate. Okay. We also talked about work that you do outside in the voluntary sector, which is completely separate. Completely separate. Um, and also the pro, do, pro bono work that the firm does as well. So could you just tell us a little bit about your experiences with those kind of three very different areas? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, I think I'll just focus on um, the, the Rajantan Foundation first. I think we set this up about five years ago. Um, our partners got together and decided to, con to put together a share of our profits, a certain percentage of our profits, and we said we'll, we'll do this as charity work. We are nowhere as big as the, the Tan Foundation, um, but, but we, we, we try our best. Um, from my experience, what, what I've seen, because I, I get all these requests, I think I get about three to four requests for funding every week. Um, a lot of them for charity golf. <laughs> a lot for charity dinners, gala dinners. Quite a number by students, a lot by students, polytechnic university students who will get together in small ad hoc groups and then they'll say, well, we're planning to go on a trip to maybe Vietnam somewhere or Myanmar somewhere, we want to do this. Um, so we, I, I get a lot of these requests. So what we decided to do was to focus on pilot projects because we're not big. So we said, look, we can fund something, maybe two, 250 for a pilot project. And our hope was that that pilot project, if it's successful, can then be taken over by maybe some of the government, you know, some of the social authorities to, to run this full time. And, and that's what we've done. Um, from my experience, we, we've, we've funded quite a few. Uh, one of the things I've noted is this. The ideas look wonderful. I mean, I mean, one of the programs that I was involved in, which was for the elderly, was perfect on paper. The difficulty sometimes tends to be that the execution uh, always sometimes doesn't quite turn out the way. So, so what, what was presented to me was something that would involve a test of 200 elderly patients, uh, a project running over one and a half years, somebody monitoring the test results every fortnight, and somebody evaluating the results. Unfortunately, along the way, um, the project director for this specific project resigned. 
and they had took them a lot of long time to find a replacement. In the end, people who were part of the pilot project kept, kept on dropping out. They, they, they couldn't find people to replace them. In the end, from an estimated 200 people who were supposed to be part of the pilot project, the results were only obtained for 30. And you know, with 30, you really can't evaluate whether it, it was a successful or not successful. So it, it's a pity, because I, I still think it was a wonderful project to help elderly. Just didn't work out. Uh, so, so this this is something I've, I've my my experience uh, when we want to give we want to you know we want to look for good innovative projects but I think now we're looking for also projects that have people who who have the ability to to sustain it to run it to fusion so that we can see the results and and hopefully help the community and and I think that's what we are now looking for when we we fund projects. Um, Graham mentioned the the other part of it, which we do pro bono work, but but, but that's legal services. Uh, we we do that uh, as and when people request us, we 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 get requests from the law society. We get very often requests from members of parliament who will call call up our partners and says, "Look, in my meet the people session, I, I I got this really difficult family case. Could be a divorce. Could be very often. <laughs> and some of the cases you see are really really horror horror stories. You know." Uh, I'll just share with you. Recently, we had somebody where the, the MP re referred the case to us. The family was in such dire straits that they had to borrow money from moneylenders. And these moneylenders were harassing them. But moneylenders' uh, modus operandi is now very simple. They say, okay, you can't pay. I'm going to burn down your house unless you go and splash paint on other people's house. <laughs> Fantastic. So this guy did it. No choice, right? He, he couldn't find the money, so he did it. Then they not only want you to do it, they want you to send them photographic evidence that you've done it. So what he brings along is he brings along his daughter who's 16 years old, studying in school with him to go and take pictures. They did it in a few flats, police captured them. So both the father and the 16 year old daughter were arrested. And it's serious, you know, it's for, I mean, the, the girls can't be caned, but you know, it's, it's a caning offense. So the, the, the the wife managed to bail out the daughter, but couldn't bail out the, because she didn't have funds to bail out both. So they went to see the MP and they are. So we, we get a lot of these really, really sad cases coming to us. So that's part of what our firm does as well, but we keep that separate from the foundation. The foundation only handles financial assistance. Graham? Okay, thanks. Yeah, so Sue Yem is just go gonna come here with just, just some examples for us, some practical examples. Okay, if I if you indulge me, uh, your time, um, we we receive a lot of uh, grants, of course, uh, weekly, monthly, all year long. That's the nature of our work. Um, from students, from individuals, from entities, all sorts. Um, not in Singapore. In Singapore, every odd thing that you can think of, we also get. We also have walk-ins. Some people just you know coming by the foundation. Tan Jin Tuan mentioned, oh, must be here. And they drop off things and they say hi, which is fine. Um, I wanted to uh, express, uh, give an ex illustration of something which transpired. Um, uh, we, amongst one of these requests that we received uh, included um, an organization, uh, a small charity, that uh, wanted our funding to, to set up a sort of learning hub. It envisioned itself to be a hub for other um, charities uh, dealing with youth at risks to come to it uh, to, as a resource center. Um, there, are a lot of, there, there are a lot of other charities that do, I think, a much better job in terms of uh, fiduciary responsibilities, outreach, programs, etc. But I didn't want to hurt their feelings um, to say no offhand, right up. So what I did was I convened um, a sort of dialogue session, invited this organization as one of the uh, speakers, like a panel like this, as well as the rest people by other groups that are really veterans in the sector, okay? Like once I throw the name, you were known, okay? So, and uh, after the, uh, during the dialogue session, of course, I also invited, I mean, you kind of, uh, I mean, a uh, sort of session without anyone listening to them. So I had to invite people to come in. And these people were people in our contact list, which included people from the courts, um, BPC, whatever, the judges, the um, superintendents, the police commissioner side, people that we knew because they eat with us, they meet us, 
they come and talk to us. Um, but these charitable heads of charity or advisors of the charities had no access to these people. Certainly, they're not going to socially meet them because they see them on Friday courts. You know what I mean? So what we did was then we convened them together. And um, during that session, I guess the charity realized that they were not in any capacity to be a leader of a hub because you cannot yourself want to be a hub. People must come to you, you know. Um, they also managed to meet a lot more contacts and friends in the sector that they were in. So that was a very useful session for them to get to know. And they were going to have a conference and they had uh, in a few months' time and they didn't have any traction with anyone. But they had prepared for speakers to come down. So they were paying a lot of money for it with no one attending, right? But now they would have at least 50 people aware of this conference and wanting to attend. So that way we've helped that group. But from that session, something else transpired. We had the judges and lawyers who were invited, realizing that we were interested in this sort of thing. And the judges wrote in with a proposal for us to fund a startup. Um, and so from there, um, the Community Justice Center, which is now located in the state courts, was founded. Uh, it is a charity that is part uh, at the state courts of Singapore in order to help needy litigants in person access the intricacies and navigate the intricacies of the law. All right, so they will be the one calling for pro bono lawyers for you and blah, 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 a more holistic uh, service. So that, from, from a, an appeal that was very random, came out to something which, you know, we have now the Chief Justice involved, everybody, I mean, the Perm Sex and Ministry of Law and MS, uh, MSF also all involved in, in supporting the cause. These were the people at the back end we were able to engage. We had meetings with them and said, uh, you can't come out money, we'll come out the money, what can you come up with? Can we have a secondment? Can we have this, that, you know? And, and that got partnerships involved, different groups to pitch in. Yeah. Yes, sure, can I go ahead? Well, Chandran mentioned about people approaching for golf. And I think some people on a smaller scale selling flowers on a Saturday, Saturday afternoon, okay? But I think there's, there's really a gap or expectation gap or some, some issue there that need to be addressed, okay? You know? The survey done by the MVPC says, well, yes, they want volunteers, but the volunteers are aged 21 to 24. Well, with due respect, age 21, 24, is not very, not very competent and skilled people. They can do a lot of things, they can sell a lot of flowers, but they can't do a lot of things in any case, okay? Then they mentioned, well, you know, to, to approach the fund, to, to approach the donors, you require some people with corporate connections, corporate links, okay? And there are a lot of charities don't have this corporate link, so they find raising funds really difficult in any case, okay? Okay. Then the, the donors, corporate donors says, well, we can give you goods in kind, service in kind in any case. Well, fine, okay, you know? In a commercial organization, we talk about revenue generation, increasing our capacity, increasing our personal size, improving our uh, brand, okay? Well, you are a very successful corporate. You have all these things. So send me your men to the smaller organizations, okay? I, I, to approach a lot of people, uh, they suggest that I must go digital. I don't know anything about digital. Send me your digital men. Okay, to a smaller charity, so they can make use of the digital skills with the things, and then approach a lot of people. If that's the if that's the way you communicate, okay. You say my human resources are very poor. Send me your human resource men, men or lady. Okay, uh, and improve my human resources. Improve improve my corporate governance. Improve my internal controls. Improve my whatever need to be. Improve any case, okay? Give me that sort of service. And I think all large corporations have that. You can't spend a person for one week, two weeks, or three weeks. No point giving me $10,000, because $10,000, well, no, not, no point, but it's good, quite good too. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but really, getting $10,000 is not going to go very far away. Okay, you know? So perhaps there's a gap in any case, okay, you know? And now a gap you have, you have is, we don't seem to have uh, partnerships between uh, the charity and the donors. Okay, but one time deal, a golf thing. We go one time thing, we call it flowers. One time thing, we, we, we do a dinner party and that sort of thing in any case, okay, you know, uh, stuff like that. But we don't have 
seems those things were kind of a partnerships where, you know, again talking about uh, Sana, okay, Sana, uh, 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 Sana skate, uh, the uh, skate holders have tattoos on their bodies, you know, these people take <laughs> So we approach the skin doctors and say, well, remove the, remove the, uh, remove the tattoos, okay, you know. So we have this partnership because it's, it's publicity for the skin doctors and at the same time they remove these uh, tattoos. And it's quite expensive to remove tattoos, not cheap things, okay, you know. I think two, $200. So it's a good partnership, but only time was the year, unfortunately, okay. But there could be other partnerships, okay, you know. Then building brands, okay, you know, we, we, we don't seem to talk about Donor retention. We talk about, in, in, in commercial, we talk about customer retention, client retention, everything, but here we don't talk about donor retention. And the donors will say, I give for one year, I give for two years, why three years? Why? Why not forever? <laughs> okay? And then we come to building brands. Again, you know, we have, uh, we have brands. We see the difficulty because we need the help in the, small, the smaller uh, charities. We need to have help to build our brand, okay? No? So we be like, you know, what do you call, uh, win or lose Manchester United, win or lose Liverpool, okay? But win or lose Sana, you know? <laughs> but unfortunately, we don't have that. So these are the kind of uh, protection gaps, and these are limitations, and I think the corporate owners can help out for some moral charities. I think the big boys, you know, NKF, SATA, they can look after themselves. Uh. Okay, no, I'm not speaking anything against them uh, uh, because uh, NKF is my audit client and Sata also is my audit client, but... <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyway, it's not public information, so... Um, I think I just have one question. I mean, I, my background is in um, helping corporates do their sustainability and responsibility programs. And I've advised a lot of corporates about, you know, kind of how to engage with the charitable sector. Do you think that there's a kind of lack of maturity? That a lot of the conversation seems to have been how can charities, you know, kind of go to corporates. But do you think there's an issue also with, with corporates themselves? They, they don't actually have the maturity in terms of dealing with, you know, people outside of the corporate sector. Do you think that's an issue? Well, it, 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 it is issue, uh, certainly based on the uh, study in the U.S. and other places, that the donors need to be constantly informed. Treat the donor as a friend and not a one-time person, one-time donor, and then next year you approach him again and sort of thing, and in case, okay, you know. But constantly keep him, keep him reminded of things like that. But just don't get the money and say thank you, you know. Give him the impression that it's important, and, and the important thing is leave experience with the donor. So a donor will have experience with you, Whatever the experience might be, you know, doing two things together, uh, seeing things around, how, how you, how you uh, carry out your activities. So he, so he or she had their experience and say, yeah, okay, no matter what, we will support this particular, this particular project or this particular charity. Okay. So, yes, maybe, well, uh, again, based on this survey, they say, well, in Singapore, uh, the large corporation, they, they have... Marketing department that's responsible for charity donation. So in marketing, they want to have do things together because marketing people are la, 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 la. okay. You know? <laughs> and then they also have uh, either they give this to their HR person, and HR person will be just kind of surveys, you know, send my people there, volunteers, and that sort of stuff. In any case, so a kind of lowly, uh, lower level. In any case, okay, you know. And so, so I think maybe we. we Charity Council should say that marketing people in a corporate organization should take over. So we have this rah, 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 great experience and maybe they, they, will, they will give us some uh, better understanding, I suppose, yeah. Anyone else want to talk about that one? Actually, it's, uh, it's, it's true. And, and, I, and I think it sometimes it depends on who you approach. I, I, I guess if you are approaching, say if you were to approach us, uh, we, we don't hire staff. I mean, it's run by it's run by partners. So, so when you come from the corporate sector, and we are all corporates, and we we are used to dealing with companies. When when a charity approaches us, unfortunately, we tend to expect a lot more in terms of how they present to us. So we tend to ask a lot more questions, harder questions. Yes, we we, we do. 
But I, I think it again depends on some some other charities may be different, right? I mean, they they've got maybe staff at, at different levels who can engage uh, charities at different levels. Uh, so I, I do agree it's it's, it's a problem, uh, but I, I guess it's it's a problem because we we are not in a position to we we have the money to give, but we also want to be responsible to our partners to make sure that we we are only giving out when we really feel that. It is a very worthy cost, so we tend to be a lot more demanding in terms of what we want, and then we tend to expect a proper corporate structure, a proper accounting, a proper reporting process, you know, uh, quarterly reports. So it, it does tend to be a bit demanding, at least from our point of view. Okay, I just I've got a few questions here that people have posted on pigeonholes. So the most the most um, uh, popular one at the moment seems to be. I mean, it, it kind of follows on for us from here. But the most popular one here seems to be, um, yeah, this one. Um, as there are a lot of uh, competition for funds, would it be acceptable for charities to spend on marketing and PR in an effort to visibly build their brand? I think it's a yes and no answer. <laughs> okay, you need to brand yourself. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you need to articulate what is your purpose and what is your intent and rather than talking about uh, work methods. So if you cannot crystallize even for yourself, what is your purpose and what's your, why are you in existence? Then I think it's a major problem. But uh, spending money on marketing and PR, well, you can get volunteers to help you. Not necessary that you have to spend the money and approach the corporates. The corporates, I think, are willing to help. I think there is one mindset in uh, MPOs that I prefer money. I don't want services because it, uh, it will disrupt my operations. But I think corporates have a lot of uh, good ideas, good initiatives that can help us as charities to improve our standard. So let's have more engagement and... Uh, Try and explain to the corporates why do you need their help. I think clarity and improved communication and continual uh, engagement is uh, important. I'd like to add that I think everybody in the outfit can be a brand ambassador for your, your organization. Um, the disjunct comes maybe when, you know, at the senior leadership, they're advocating one thing then percolating down the road, you don't hear the same story from everybody. The ones I'm really impressed with some of the charities is you don't care, the tea auntie also to tell you the same story. You know, not, it's throughout. They have the same vision, same mission. They know things uh, from different perspectives. I'm really impressed. And these charities and outfits do exist in Singapore. So that's... Yeah, I mean, I, fr from experience um, previously, I, and also if you look at the um, the... the the, the Spire consulting um, survey that was done, one of the gaps that came out in that was, was about using competencies rather than just cash donations. Um, and, and it states in there that, you know, it, it, it's not used very well in Singapore right now. So again, I think, is, is that partly, it's chicken and egg, whose who's kind of fault is it? You know, who, who should be pushing that? So I suppose, you know, if we're talking about innovation, which you mentioned, um, uh, Chandra, before, is that something that we need to look at to approach people in a, in a slightly different way? I know certainly in the UK, when I was working for KPMG, one of the things that they did um, was that some of the partners actually mentored head teachers from schools because they couldn't think of how to actually engage with people and they wanted to give their skills rather than just cash. And you know, when you're, when you're a high school teacher, you kind of get to the top of your profession and then there's no one to really talk to and, and have a network with. So they actually went and said, you know, now you're running a business, in a sense. You know, you're top of the tree in that school. You're not just a teacher anymore. And, and, and that's something that they did, and that went down very well. So it's maybe those kind of innovative things that people need to potentially start thinking about. Yeah, maybe I give two examples. Uh, one is uh, YMCA's collaboration with Tan Chin Tuan Foundation. We started small about 10 years ago, right? And uh, Tan Chi Tuan Foundation uh, uh, actually supported our different kind of programs. Uh, wasn't program specific, but generic. Then later on, as we communicate, as we work together, 
we find that uh, that uh, okay, the foundation has their needs, YMCA has our own needs, and we move into specific programs funding. And when we talk about KPIs, it's not really only the numbers, but I think if we can generate good testimonies out of it, I don't think the foundations will be so crude to tell you, hey, these are not numbers. Well, I, I believe uh, foundations are set up and they have a heart, so they will be able to understand that. Now, on the branding and raising visibility, uh, YMC has run this program with Citibank for 14 years, City Youth for Courses. Uh, the aim is to get the students to come in, do branding and uh, raise awareness for the various VWOs that the children pick, the students pick, and uh, secondarily raise funds for the VWO. And uh, ultimately, if the students' projects are good, the VWO can adopt it and maybe turn it into a social enterprise. Uh, this program has run for 14 years. It's not easy. Citibank never, in the first instance, commit to us that I'm going to support you for 15 years. No. In fact, our fund renewal is on an annual basis. Every year, we have to work with Citibank Singapore to go to City Foundation in the US and ask for the funding. How much? 160,000 Singapore dollars. But we are competing worldwide, Citibank. So don't think that big charities is easy to get money. I'm not saying it's difficult, but you need to know what you are, what you are selling, your brand. What is the brand that you are selling? What are you physically actually doing? What is the good, do good that you are doing? Not so much the method and the project and the program, but more is how can you impact, how can you bring other things to the, to the plate? And uh, thankful, uh, really a blessing that uh, we are still continuing the program, at least definitely for this year. Mm. We'll continue to do it next year. <laughs> So he's given a specific example related to YMCA. So let me just explain from the donor's point of view why we still give to them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> That's why we have caca between us. Uh, <laughs> as you know, um, the predece his predecessor is also here. Is Albert Ching here? Like Jen, right? Okay. And he mentioned the programs that are 10 to 14 years old and things like that. Clearly then, the relationship between the organizations existed before Chiwen uh, became its sec gen, all right? But it didn't mean that with the change in leadership, everything also threw out the bathwater. There was a transition and a smooth flow. So as a donor, I feel comfortable with the organization. It doesn't mean that, you know, new head, new ego, new territory, everything I want to have my own style, all right? And then everything changes. For a donor, it's very disruptive. You mean the last projects I've been funding for six or seven or eight years is lousy? No longer useful? What's happening? What about the money I invested that was supposed to last over three years and you happen to come in during the midterm of the three years? All right, so kind of um, uh, keeping the donor engaged. Of course, Albert, certainly when he uh, moved, before he moved on, he already prepared that. And that helped with us as a donor to transition. Also, another point is that um, previously, of course, the, you know, when the foundation started in 1976, a long time ago, and then it was like very uh, hard luck cases. We were just, oh, no, can I give to this and that? And um, we changed our model because, of course, the needs have evolved and the way people do things are so different now. Uh, we've decided to park some of that funding to larger NGOs or stronger ones. You know, and I would say, YMC would be considered a large um, charity. But why? Because you can give them a bit and they have scalability. One phone call or activate 160 volunteers. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, that was, thank you. You know, and, things, and that's also aligned with what we want. We want them to be able to have that sort of contact. That's the test. That when I call you and do it, you can really activate. No? You say you can. You count, count, count. I don't know how you counted it. But when it really comes to shove, can it really be done? And it's been done a few times, okay? Um, in spite of whatever leadership changes and all. To me, the overall picture is still smooth running, you know, and accountability. That's it. I still insist on gift reports every year, and I'm very thorough with it. Highlight, annoying, footnote, question mark, a lot. It's like teacher going through a lot of red marks. And they, they're big charity, but they will review and redo all the grid, everything. And what do I ask and what do I look for? In fact, I'll prep them and say, this is just the draft. 
this is not the ultimate thing, and you pass up, it's either F9 or no, no, no. It's a work in progress. Okay, I'm looking for some things. These are some of the things I'm looking for. Can you draft it something aligned to this or close to this? And if I feel that, oh, a big request should be coming soon, that means their funding in tranches will end soon. I don't, they should know, but they may not be so aware if you're having so many donors. But then I will start seeding it. You do know, right? Big tip that your funding is going to end soon. The funding cycle. Maybe you'd like to think of, you know, doing something together, a gift report. Because you, you're not just any other charity. The basic charities I expect like that. You know, it's all right because they are struggling. But if you are a YMCA child charity and you say you're 100 and how many years old, then you're not just an ordinary charity. You must show that you're a leader among the charities. So what have you done to show leadership and stewardship for other charities in the sector and for the sector at large? Okay, I can be quite macro, but I can be very micro. For instance, you may want to do this, this, and this. Now, for instance, there was an opportunity. I know they have a Y Proms. Some of you might also know because of uh, some of the saga that happened for one of the Y Proms. But they have a yearly Y Proms. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. If I create, let's say, um, uh, I want to bring droves of my beneficiaries from other charities to attend your Y Proms, is that okay? Okay. He said, all right. And I'm going to do a photo contest. I will give each beneficiary that I invite from the 20 over 5 charities a point and shoot camera because during your Y Proms, the event photographer will take the stage, right, as usual. But no one takes around what's happening. So I'm going to have a little photo thing leveraging on your existing activity. So I called this one, I Cherish. So you must have photos of people cherishing one another and not a dustbin and don't know what they're thinking, you know. After that, we had 3,000 entries from the beneficiaries that we invited. At the end of the concert, I, I mean, they're needy beneficiaries, so they're not going to have money to develop your photos. Huh? So I collected all the point and shoot cameras and developed them myself. And from there, I chose the top like 19 photos and these were exhibited on the YMCA wall. They had a stretch of wall. It was very surprising. They said, oh, the YMCA fourth level youth, uh, the hostel, cafe, uh, there's a wall free between the Tanjin Tuan rooms. We have rooms there. And uh, I said, uh, maybe you want to put a picture of Tanjin Tuan there. I said, no, thanks. Uh, but if I, you have the wall free, can I borrow it for a month? They said, okay, but what do you want to do with it? I want to put my photos, the photos of all these charities up there. Because when people go to your youth hostel and they have to eat in the morning breakfast and they come from all over the world to stay at the YMCA youth hostel, they are going to get to know at least 19 charities that exist in Singapore and do very hard work. And how it looks in your gift report is that YMCA is a steward and a, uh, among charities, the leader. It provides platforms for them to be showcased and for other people all over the world because YMCA is an international organisation to get to know other charities that exist in Singapore. Doesn't it look very good in your gift report? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks yeah. very much for that. Let me just. Add a bit? Uh, yeah, Kaka, go ahead. Well, on the on on competition of funds, I think well it will be there, but certainly the smaller charities need help in any case. Okay, you know. So maybe I give you an example about the brand name and marketing and PR. Okay, you know? I'm with the Lex Association. Okay, you know. So when we started a few years ago, I mean long time ago, but first few years it was very difficult until Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said he was dyslexic. So when he say he was dyslexic, everybody in Singapore, or almost everybody in Singapore, became dyslexic and came to us. Okay. Uh, so it was good branding, okay, you know. And, and since then, we have been quoting that, and of course, our, I mean, we have also done a good job, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, you know. So that's all. And then I, I think the grant makers say, well, they want to see that money is well spent, what properly accountable for. Well, if you want to make sure your money is well spent and accountable for, okay, engage your... Uh, Share services. I'm also with share services. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions that are kind of fairly similar. I think we've gone beyond the scope of that, that particular question. There's one here, how to attract um, for-profit organizations to partner not-for-profits. I think we've kind of talked about some of those. Um, we'll just take a slightly different track for, for this question now. It should be coming up here. Um, with smaller not um, not-for-profits, not there's always a challenge when it comes to accommodating corporate volunteers. How can we overcome these challenges without upsetting them? Chandra, do you have any ideas on that from your, your work with um, CDCs? No, I, I think with the C, no, I, this is not something I would, the CDC is slightly different. I, I chair this food aid fund. 
um, which raises money for needy, needy residents. Yeah. We, we've been successful. We started about six years ago. We've been fairly successful. But in relation to the previous question, uh, the, the one thing I can say is this. Uh, the, the way in which we raise money, we tell them, please give us just $100 a month, gyro it. And it's been building. We, we now collect about 800000 plus per year. But the one thing I tell them is not one cent would be spent on anything other than food for needy residents. So, so that's been uh, important for me insofar as the, the previous question is concerned. Uh, this is not something that we, the, the CTC, is, uh, the food aid fund is slightly different. What we do is that uh, I chair a committee. Uh, every year I try to bring in like say eight to 10 people. We, we tell them about the food aid fund and then we, we, we sit down, we, we have lunches, we, we sort of spend some money on them on lunches and we tell them, can you please go to your own networks, find, find maybe just 10 people for me. Sign up 10 people for me, and, and through that, that way, we, we build this, this, this process. But it's very personal. And I think unfortunately, a lot of charity work has to be sometimes very, very personal. It's people you know, people your own, with your own connections. Yeah. I think quite a lot of um, corporates, certainly from my experience, they want this kind of big bang as well. They want to have a CSR week or a CSR couple of days and they'll throw kind of 200 people at you for two days, but then they're not around for the rest of the year. I mean, how can, you know, MPOs cope with that? I mean, for, for, for us as, as a law firm, I think it's slightly different because in a sense, people coming to us for help, uh, especially like legal services, pro bono work, they, they come throughout the entire year. But what we found is, you know, there's, there's so many, especially from our staff, you know, our secretaries, our HR staff, our accounts people, they just want sometimes to be given a chance to go out and do something. So the time when we did the blister pack program, when they were launching it, all these needy, all these elderly people were there. What, what our staff wanted to do was, they wanted to say, can we organize a lunch for them? So they, about 20 of them turned up, they, they cooked for them, they, they fed them. So, so always remember that there's actually a lot of people out there who actually want to they, they may not be in a position to give money, but they certainly are in a position to, to give their time and their services. It's always important to know how to tap them uh, usefully. Okay, thanks. I, I, one more. There's an interesting question. There's only actually got a couple of votes here, but I think it's quite an interesting question, so I will ask it anyway. Um, a lot is... Is this one coming up? I pressed active there. A lot is said about MPOs learning from corporates. Does the panel feel that corporates can learn from NPOs? <laughs> if so, what do they think corporates can learn? Silence. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any ideas? It's obviously a very good question, isn't it? Enthusiasm? Yeah. Dedication, hard work. Well, when you say learn, it depends on what you talk about, learning, learning what in your case, okay, you know. So, uh, sure, the, the corporates uh, are well organized in a lot of matters, marketing and finance and controls and human resources and IT and everything in your case, okay, you know. But if you're talking about, you know, the promotion of public good, then they can learn from NPOs because NPOs are there to promote public good. Okay, a lot of, uh, well not a lot, some uh, corporates are there merely to make money, but they can look at their responsibility, right? CSR nowadays talk about. So there are a lot of areas which they can cover. I mean, which they can take part in and cover in a case. And we talked about earlier about the smaller, uh, smaller uh, charities having difficulties with volunteers. Uh, yes, you know, corporates have, uh, in the human resources, about uh, having employees building up their all-round experience and that sort of thing. One of the all-round experiences to work in, with volunteer organization. But the problem is, you know, for instance, for instance I, by way of example, you know, the association, we need volunteers, but we don't need volunteers to teach our students because to teach our students, you require highly trained teachers. So what can the volunteers do there? Clean the floor? Well, the, yeah, pork this cleaning. But uh, I don't think they come there for that. Okay, so okay. so that, I think there's maybe some mismatch stuff, but it can be can be arranged certainly. See, when Mr. Kaka says students, he point to me. 
Okay, I'm just kidding. But I have six words to reply to this question. Uh, what corporates can learn from MPOs, right? Uh, M oh, five, I make it. MPOs punch above their weight. Right? They're usually under-resourced um, in terms of money or expertise, time, etc. But they always, I find, try their best to punch above their weight. And uh, some of the best EDs, you know, I found not in the corporates but in the non-profit world because with so little, they can really do so much. It's just amazing. Okay, um, I think we've actually come to the end of our um, the end of our panel now. Um, it's gone very quickly. I was kind of checking there with an hour. Um, could we just just kind of closing remarks? Just go round to each of you. Chandra, do you want to just start off? Uh, this is just any kind of you know thirty seconds closing remarks from what you think of our discussions this afternoon. Um, just very quickly, what what we look for. Okay. Uh, Come with a very clear, defined purpose. They know exactly what is it that you want, how you want to achieve that objective. Um, have clear parameters, have clear guidelines, benchmarks, uh, some, uh, some way of evaluating the, the, the value of what you're doing. Uh, and just make sure that the personnel running it uh, are going to be there, or at least, uh, as, as um, Suyin said, if, if there has to be a change in the, in the personnel, just make sure it's an orderly transition so that the objective that you set out to achieve can, can, still, be, can still be carried out, even though personalities or the people are no longer there. Thanks. Chi Wan? Okay. Um, maybe um, uh, it may be something more far stretch, but uh, if corporates and MPOs can work that every organization can become a beautiful organization. I think it will be nice. Kaka, do you have something to finish with? Well, we've been celebrating SG50, and we were told 50 years ago we were earning 1,005, and now we're earning 75,000. Okay, so we are first, first world country. We are pretty well off, okay. So we are better than Americans. Uh, <laughs> then I found that while the Americans donate six times more than the Singaporeans, and there are numerous grant makers in Singapore, handful. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of uh, partnerships and joint venture between corporates and NPOs in the States, and I think we. Uh, that's where we should be looking for too and, and really have more donors and certainly more services and there are a lot of poor people in Singapore a lot of needy people in Singapore a lot of, we can do a lot of good in any case don't, don't have to be needy things in any case okay, you know. so uh, Bill Gates starts uh, something you know, build toilets for India okay, you know. of course the Indians don't go for toilets anyway but, uh, <laughs> okay. uh, as for Taylor you know, spend money for, uh, for HIV in any case okay, you know. Of course, she's not suffering by HIV. Uh, neither she has friends with HIV. But it's a cause, uh, okay? People get mentioned, well, yeah, as for Taylor, HIV in any case. You know? So I think uh, uh, Singapore still has a long way to go on that score. Just, you just got a few oh, words. Okay. Um, sure. More like a question. If you are a business, who is your lifeline? Your customers, right? If you are a charity, who is your lifeline? Mm. Your beneficiaries, if you treat as your customers, or is your donors, are your donors your lifeline? So something just to think about. Yeah. Okay, so that brings a close to all things. I mean, I, I always quite like finishing off uh, panels with um, some alliteration. So I think I got from what this discussion was, was four Ps today. Um, so professionalism, and I think that's been a key throughout the day. Governance, transparency, reporting, relationships. Um, partnerships, we need to be innovative in developing them. Promotion and purpose of your ideas. Um, making sure that people understand what it is that your outcomes are, are trying to be. Um, and, and being practical as well. 
you know, don't, don't have too much expectations from th that corporates are going to be some kind of saviour. Thank you very much. Can you thank the panel? Uh, closing remark. Uh, there's this guy known, known to be the father of modern management called Peter F. Drucker. And you'll find a statement somewhere that he says the most effective organisation in the world. And he listed one. And it's a charity. So you understand why we have this conference, it's so that you can be the most effective organisations in Singapore and teach the corporates a thing or two and, and also leverage on them, okay? Uh, see you next year or next round town hall meeting. Yes, next town hall meeting. Okay, thank you.